Oh, this is going to be fun. All right, let's get comfortable. So, Brad, Nick mentioned you're a Badger. You mentioned you're on campus for not only great football years, well, uh, and kind of as Alvarez was building things, you were here when the terrace was built. You were here when the Cole Center was built. So let's start with the softball. Year one of Luke Fickle, give me a letter grade on Badger football. It's hard to say. I think that college football today is incomplete. When you have a 13-0 team that's not playing for the national title, I think it's a total failure. Um, but I like what I'm seeing. The Big Ten of when I was there with Ron Dane in Dane County – has changed tremendously to what we're going to see. And I think we're going to see a little bit more of the Russell Wilson era. Um, I, you know, I think that once Fickle gets his players in there, he'll be ready to play against the Washingtons, the USC's, the Oregon's of the world. And if you watch Michigan play now and you watch Ohio State play, we're playing more of a pro style offense. And it's nice to play a little bit of that, but we still got to make sure we have a good offensive and defensive line. And, you know, that's what we get with being in the state of Wisconsin. So put me on the record, expanded college football playoff. Fickle will take us to the new 12-team playoff at some point. Put it on the record. Okay, uh, moving, moving uh, forward. Without a doubt, I'll okay. fail. We're, we're already in agreement. So, Brad, we, we've done deals together. You do deals all over the country, all sorts of different industries, as Nick alluded to. What's the role of a site selector as an advisor to the business community? And when you're working on something, who's your first call? Well, I think first and foremost, everything that we focus on is risk mitigation, right? Um, those in the business world understand that timing is everything, right? So we want to make sure that we get everything done in, a, in the most expedited time and all the boxes are checked. We don't want to be building a building and all of a sudden find out that we needed to pull a permit that's going to take six to eight months or that we need to get a utility line or a gas line because it's not wide enough. So our first goal is to mitigate all development risks. I would say, you know, it really, and as to who we call first, it's really going to de depend, right? You know, I have a great relationship with you, and I also have a great relationship with Coleman Piper. So I am Mary Perry when she used to work at the WDC and same with Trisha Braun. But, like, if I have something in Wisconsin right now, I'd say the first person that I call sometimes just to get an idea of who's still there is Coleman Piper. Um, but that's no different than me doing a project in Georgia where I'll pick up the phone and call someone from Georgia Power or when we're doing something in the Carolinas and calling Duke Energy. Um, power today is probably the most critical location factor to any project. Anything above five megawatts is going to have a consideration of power, not only due to the fact that getting the power, but it's also the supply chain that we are so far behind in the United States with the breakers, the switch gear and the transformers, bringing the power into the building and having the panels and being able to get there. So that supply chain is critical. And listen, um, these this pandemic changed the American workforce. We have so many people that are in gig jobs, whatever that means. Um, and finding people to go to work is a big challenge. So. Companies are saying, we still need to make our product. People are still making money and still buying our product. So we have to go somewhere that has a great energy policy, is favorable for manufacturing, and looks at automation okay. And we are seeing way more automated uh, facilities than we did in the past. Okay, so you mentioned workforce, power, supply chain, energy, business climate. WMC, we follow a lot of the rankings. I'm sure many of you do, whether it's CNBC, it's Forbes, it's Area Development. You're on the editorial board for Area Development. It's CEO Magazine. I shorthand refer to these as beauty pageants. How much stock should we put in the rankings on best state for business, best geography for this, best location for that? How much stock should we put into that? And then when you're in the boardroom with clients, so what do they pay attention to? Well, I'll talk about Area Development just because I sit in the room during the ranking process. The way that they do the ranking is they take a survey from business leaders and they validate who the business leader is based on the email address that it comes in through. And then they also have a select group of consultants that have actually done projects um, and not economic development. And they take those rankings and we look at what, but when we put the rankings, a lot of it is the scoring is done by the editorial board, meaning what we're seeing in today's economy, what is scoring? 
But if you look at the rankings and area development, CEO, site selection, you're going to see kind of the same, you know, five or seven states over, you know, constantly since 2010. I mean, it's the Georgias, the South Carolina, the North Carolina, the Tennessee, the Indiana, and the Ohio. What I will say, though, is that we did under um, Mark Hogan's leadership see the WDC in Wisconsin perk up and get into that category and start winning some of those bigger projects. But what we're seeing now, surprisingly, is Illinois, um, your neighbors to the south, which used to be. Say, say it again, Brad, for effect for the people in the back. It's Illinois. So we we're just looking at the rankings and back. Illinois area development has them as the 20th best state for doing business. And when we're in our office, that's the stuff that you're like, you know, I'm losing it. That, that just accelerates the process. When I see Illinois ahead of Wisconsin on the best state for business rankings, run a, go deeper on that if you would. Well, I think it's funny because I met Wade probably 10, 10 16 years ago, 17 years ago. They were recruiting a company called Kennel Manufacturing that was based in Gurney, Illinois. They started in Chicago in the 1930s, right during the war as providing lighting for the war machine, right? Um, Chicago-based manufacturer. Um, the CEO went, got educated with an engineering degree. They got into LED lighting. In the economic development effort at that time from the M7 and Cabo was, let's go find good manufacturers that are struggling with manufacturing in Illinois and let's get them into Wisconsin. And then once they see how great Wisconsin is, they'll continue to keep moving north, north, and north. And as we saw that, I saw that massive development go up and down I-94 from the point of the border in Pleasant Prairie all the way up in County and so forth. Um, wow, I would, but maybe someone was telling me something. But with that being the case, they came with the full arsenal and the full arsenal was led by the governor that understood bond rating and debt and what it meant for a company to be here for a stable business environment. And they were selling the Wisconsin stable business environment. And at that moment in time, that was when the manufacturing agricultural tax credit came and said, hey, if you're in agriculture and you're manufacturing, we want you. And that was the message that was sent out to the America, you know, to the consulting community, to all the, you know, anyone display from a real estate um, on and so forth. Is me hitting this? Um, but with that being the case, what ended up happening is manufacturers to look at Wisconsin because maybe if we could get a handheld mic, keep going, buddy. Yeah, was that better? That what manufacturers understood in that situation was that the great history of Wisconsin manufacturing, all the way from the great history of Wisconsin manufacturing, going all the way back to the days of all the foundries and Kohler and Kohler and the manufacturing talent in Wisconsin were being revitalized. And Wisconsin went on this massive manufacturing run and they understood what their resources. I, I just haven't seen that. I mean, if you see the announcements today, you know, the announcements are in the Southeast in the strongholds now that are maintaining the announcements in the battery belt, which is really what's driving everything or Surprisingly, Illinois, being a resident there, I'm still shocked. Um, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, which makes sense due to their historical automotive, but it's going all up and down 75 and 65 and even 95 on the coast in that boom on the manufacturing. And that's something that Wisconsin could be a part of. And they have to work a little bit harder because they're out of that supply chain because the distance is so far. So in terms of when you're in the boardroom advising clients, what are some of the trends? You talked about power, certainly the cost, but also the the timing on how quick can you get the make how quick can you get the dirt ready, get the site ready? How quick can you get the get five megawatts to the site to power the facility? What's the timing on equipment installation and up and running? And I think you're right, timing is everything. But what are the other factors, Brad, that go into the site select and site selection uh blender or meat grinder that company because you start looking at 10 states and 50 municipalities and ultimately the facility only goes to one so walk us through that funnel and that meat grinder so i'm just going to give you a real life example we're down to two sites now we sent our fees out to 18 states got back um seeking power that could ramp up to 150 megawatts 
had to be within a certain supply chain. Wisconsin was not a part of that supply chain. So I was just, we received back 116 sites. We validated based on timing, who was there, based on the responses we got, uh, because that's a critical component. We get a lot of documentation back. The states that were very well versed in the site understood what was there. A lot of these sites were brownfield, meaning that they were an existing manufacturing facility or had some environmental conditions and the state was involved already in fixing it. And from there, we eliminated a lot of them, what we have a call fatal flaw. And that fatal flaw was somewhere that there was never going to meet the terms. We needed 40 megawatts within 24 months. There was, we got down to, at that moment in time, I think 32 states got on an airplane and rental cars and ate a lot of Zach B's, Chick-fil-A, Burger King, Subway, you name it all. Looked at 32 states in two weeks, saw the sites, walked them. You know, you would walk a site, someone says it looks good, and then you walk and you see a monitoring well. Or you're walking, you're seeing a wetland right in the middle. Um, so we evaluated all those and we came back, I think, with 12 sites from there that were controllable. We went, we took the client, the North American COO and the VP of manufacturing, and we toured the other 12 and ultimately got down to two. Each state presented two times, once to us, once to the client. We're down to two. Um, the critical factors were the willingness for the government to do something. Um, the governor was at, has made phone calls to our North American CEO and to the global CEO. Um, the governor has been involved writing letters, emails, phone calls, um, and presenting the CEOs of the energy companies. Hence, there's a lot of power has been there. But I would say that the two states that are in contention are two southern states. Um, they are very, 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 very strong. Um, they lead with strength of the governor's office and their economic development is very strong in their willingness to put to not try to put a square peg into a round hole was to create the whole square so we could fit in easily. And so their willingness and adaptability to change with and be nimble was critical. And I think that falls into a point where I think a lot of people forget, like when most companies endeavor on a site selection project, they're not hiring a consultant. I'd say it's maybe 65% of all projects are done by someone in the CEO says to the VP of manufacturing, hey, go find us another facility, call a real estate broker, find some land, we'll build it. So that first call from that VP of manufacturing is either gonna be to a town economic development official or to a state economic development official. And if those people aren't empowered to make decisions or have the ability and the wherewithal and the training to help, they're doing it, you know, someone's going to make a mistake. And a high stakes mistake. And the reality is, is I, I started my career at Deloitte like 20 years ago. I used to get excited for a $25 million project. Now it's like, those are, you know, there's a bunch of those, but it's the billion dollar projects are here and there's an abundance of those. And I will tell you a $25 million project with a family owned company is much harder to get done than a billion dollar company with a publicly traded multinational business. So in Wisconsin, obviously a sh very strong, proud footprint of privately held companies, but also a significant corporate footprint here. You've talked a little bit about bringing Kennel across the border, the governor operating as the closer in that project. Wisconsin uh, economic development as a team sport. You mentioned the two t Southern states leading with strength coming through the governor's office, collaborative nature, if you had to put the grade on Wisconsin, similar to Coach Fickle, what letter grade would you give Wisconsin as a place to do economic development right now? What's working, what's not? Or, or actually, Brad, what's working and what could be done better? We'll put in softer. First, before I say anything, is there anyone from the WDC in the room? That's problem number one. Um, it's it's a collaborative relationship, right? Um, there, I have a relationship with people at every single state in the country, I would say, I wish I had a relationship in Hawaii. I've never done anything there. Um, and I've done one project in Alaska. But in the lower 48, I have a relationship with someone that's constantly calling and trying to understand what we're working on, what they can do better, 
but also when you have that relationship with someone, they can say, hey, we have a project with another consultant. They're talking about something like this. Is this, is this something you think we should do? Does it make sense? And it's that collaborative conversation. I think the WDC has challenges, right? It is a quasi 501c3, but it doesn't have the ability to raise money to hire the correct project managers that are capable, I would say, uh, be, and get paid the right amount of money to actually do it to compete. Um, the reason why my first call isn't to Georgia is because that project management is once you're good in Georgia, you leave and you go work for the power company or you go work in the private sector. So we call either the regional economic development organizations, um, the 501c3s, the Jobs Ohio, the Missouri Partnerships, the Charlotte, Re the Charlotte Regional Partnership, KCADC, you know, St. Louis, Columbus 2020. We call them first. Jobs Ohio, though, was fantastic. They're funded. Are they the best in the nation, Brad? Kenny and his team? I'd say from a state. My 501c3, I'd say that they're right up there. I mean, they're funded. They, I think that they did the right thing. They're funded with liquor money. And there's a lot of liquor drinkers and beer drinkers in the state of Ohio. And we don't, we that, don't, we don't have any here. Right. I mean, I, they, like they added a one cent tax years ago onto all the liquor, and all the liquor has to be sold by a state facility, um, kind of like Canada with the beer store. If you've ever been in Canada, but they took that money and they utilized that money in investing into with cash, but investing into deals. They validated with strong project managers, but they also hired, I wouldn't call them titans of industry, but they hired VP of operations from supply chain companies, VP of operations from data center companies, from semiconductor companies, so that when they went out and had a meeting with Intel, somebody knew exactly what the critical risk factors were for Intel from the state and already knew how they were going to address it and they were ready to win. I would say I watch from a distance the WDC go after with Trisha and Coleman go after and win Haribo. They knew Haribo's critical factor was water and they figured out how to get them the right amount of water because they took a resource that Wisconsin had, you know, and I think it was like all of a sudden now it became the great water state or something. And you still rank really high in water and you still have water. Um, and they took that water resource and they sold it to a company making gummy bears that was making their first investment. And what they recognized is they got on a plane and they went to Germany and they said, what do you need to be successful? And it was water. And that deal, they were in second place the entire time until they took that water vision and went there because Haribo is going to be where Sears is headquarters in in Hoffman Estates. Now I think there's a data center, right? That's it. I mean, it was understanding what the company needed to do and taking that reverse look as to what attributes do we have in our ground, in our people, and who can we sell to? If I were in charge of the WDC, I would be on a plane to Nevada, into um, Arizona every single day, finding out which companies don't have enough water and how they can come to Wisconsin and we'll get them water. And we'll figure out how to move them there and you can make your food and you can make your beverages there. You'll have enough wastewater and fresh water because it's here. I would look at what people need and what Wisconsin can offer as opposed to sitting there and waiting for someone to call Wisconsin and say, this is what we're going to play, play to your strengths, proactive versus reactive, double down on the manufacturing future. A decade ago, Brad, when we were running around and I was, I was, had the privilege of uh, going out and saying, Wisconsin's the land of milk and honey, move north, leave Illinois. And we did some of those deals together. We talked a lot about uh, the right to work legislation that was passed, unionization. Uh, obviously, many executives are reluctant to talk about that publicly. In the boardroom, what's the conversation? Uh, how pronounced is the conversation regarding unionization rates or right to work legislation in the states being considered? That We'll talk to a client and one of the first things is they will say, we don't want to not, we want to go to only a right to work state. We want to afford our job opportunities to everyone and we don't want to be controlled by a union. Now there may be some opportunities where they may need to be next to supplier and they have to be a union state. 
But if they don't have to, from a manufacturing perspective, they don't need it. Um, my major here in this beautiful town was international foreign policy, but I took a lot of history classes. And obviously when we had the manufacturing, and I would tell everyone, if you have Amazon Prime, watch The Men Who Built America. It talks about Rockefeller, Tesla, Edison, Carnegie, Vanderbilt. It's a great like historical documentary. And it has inserts from like current American industry Titan leaders. But it talks about this revolution, right? And it explains kind of how we built the railroad industry and how we had, you know, boilers and how we did the oil industry and we didn't have protection for the American worker at a time where our labor conditions were very different. When you look at manufacturing today, you have great floors, great writing, great lighting. And most people are walking around with a tablet monitoring machine. These aren't the days of people hammering and nailing. I think the harder construction jobs are the physical construction of building a building. But when you walk into manufacturing today, whether it's an automotive facility, whether it's a tool and die shop, most of the work is the hard manual labor that we envisioned when unions came about at the turn of the century were are not there anymore and there are going to be some dirty industries um energy you know maybe a little bit tougher and to some extent but i think when you walk into a manufacturing facility the reason why a manufacturing job is so great is because the skill set level needs to be raised so much higher because we're not looking at just putting a nut into or a screw into something we're actually monitoring the pressure on a machine or the temperature. Do we need to cool it down? Do we? What's the temperature of like the chemical? So our manufacturing people that start in the beginning as an entry level will learn more inside a manufacturing facility and be the level of an engineer, not fully as an engineer, but will have such a high technical level and acumen that will allow them to traverse across the country into so many different sectors of manufacturing. And, and to your point, Brett, that's why at WMC, State Chamber, State Manufacturers Association, State Safety Council, every year we release corporate safety awards throughout the state, as well as a business friend of the Environment Award in partnership with Waste Management, because this isn't your dirty, dumb, dangerous, dark manufacturing. This is high wage, high tech, um, high skill manufacturing. Another tactical question is two years ago on this stage, I had the privilege getting up, introducing our Wisconsin 2035 report. If those of you remember or you've heard the presentation, geeks like me spent a lot of time comparing census data. And we took economic growth, population growth, and put on top of that tax rates. You mentioned some of the southern six, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Georgia, you omitted Florida, didn't mention Texas, you included Indiana, Ohio, states states where they have a strong business climate, but also a strong team mentality to economic development. How important is tax rate business climate as part of the deal? Well, I'll pick on Governor DeSantis a little bit. Um, he thinks that that's the utmost important. And he publicly stated in the debate in Miami that he eliminated the Economic Development Organization, which I think was a bad thing. And it was so surprising to see a governor that wants to elevate himself to the next level, do that. I was surprised. I think Enterprise Florida was a good organization. That the Speaker of the House didn't like it, but Florida struggles. I mean, Florida did, but Florida did in the pandemic. Is Florida played to their strength? They recognize that New York City was closed. Um, the way that they were operating New York City was like a police state, no different than Chicago or Illinois. Um, that they were operating like that and people started to realize that they didn't need to be in the financial district to be a trader or to do this. So he went after Goldman Sachs, um, Citadel. Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones that he won, but he went after hedge funds and they turned Miami into a financial service center, Palm Beach, Tampa, Naples, you name it. They went after where people realized that they could live in a warm weather environment in the winter and go to work in a financial services sector. Did it work? I guess, yes. I mean, but when you look at the population growth in that I-4 corridor between Tampa, 
in Orlando, and then you obviously have that industrial base in Lakeland. They don't make anything in Florida. And the challenge that Florida faces is it's so expensive to get stuff to the south because trucks are driving all the way in and they're coming back empty. So Florida said, okay, we're going to invest in our ports. Well, I don't want to bring anything on a deep water port to Miami because it doesn't do me any good. I still got to get through 12 hours of Florida on a truck. Hence, you see the growth, obviously, in the port. So from a tax perspective, um, income tax, there is a corporate income tax in Florida, and it's high. And corporations that are publicly traded pay it, right? Florida property taxes are high, but their education is not good. Um, and by the way, you can't even insure your home um, unless you pay thousands and thousands of dollars because of a natural disaster risk. So does it help in that situation? No. Where it helps is a Tennessee because millennials went to Nashville, um, great growing facility. Um, you saw Amazon go to Nashville. You saw, what's the name? There's like a financial services company came to Nashville. You saw all this growth in the tech sector. We've seen that in Charlotte. We've seen it in Austin. I mean, North Carolina is on this process of reducing their income tax rate. I mean, if you're looking to gain revenue on taxing corporations, that's a failed concept. I mean, corporations with sophisticated tax planning and a multi-state environment are not paying state taxes. And if you're a manufacturer here and greater than 80% of your operations are manufacturing, you're not paying state income tax here either. So I wouldn't, but state corporate income tax rate is just a number that's figuratively there that punishes services companies, in my opinion. Um, it's the state, um, individual tax that's really driving where people want to live. 90% of companies are pass-through entities, so it's both small businesses and employees. I would say correct, 100%. But taxes, do we look at them? I don't know. From a corporate perspective, we look at them from a perspective, are they going to hit them? I think, but my clients are looking what we would call above the line taxes, personal property, real property, sales tax, utility tax, inventory tax. And then when you start to look at Texas, now that everybody realized that like they don't have to be in Texas and they can be somewhere else, you're seeing that change. I mean, Texas's economy is a country within itself. But here's a crazy thing. If you're a food manufacturer, right, and you want to sell to Walmart, the largest cross stock facility for Walmart is in Dallas. So I go to what I go to um Dallas, I set up shop and I'm a meat distributor or I'm a brat distributor and all my brats are going to the Dallas cross stack. If my inventory is there for over 180 days, I'm nailed on inventory tax. So it makes Texas more expensive that it's actually cheaper for me to go north of the border to Oklahoma and drive it down 100 miles and deliver it to the Walmart cross stack. So understanding what's going on and understanding the supply chain is there? I think that's why you haven't seen Texas win as much on the renewable energy um, battery, you know, vehicle, which is another scam as well, too. I mean, ask any of your utility providers. Our grid is not strong enough to have this many electric vehicles right now, nor would I want to have an EV vehicle driving from Eagle River after the snowmobile festival trying to get somewhere without having the ability to have gas in a car. Real life example, we do represent a lot of EV companies, but real life example, I flew to Phoenix, Arizona um, in July. I know not for pleasure, for work. It was 122 degrees. The only car that was left at the Hertz rental facility was a Tesla. So we took it thinking it'd be great because we were running the air conditioning and cooling the battery, driving from the airport to Glendale, which is all about 28 miles. I went from a 90% charge to a 40% charge. We didn't have a charger anywhere near site. We couldn't get back to the airport. We left the car in Glendale and took an Uber back to the airport. And the car was there and Hertz had to go pick it up because we were afraid we were not going to be able to charge it because it would have taken an hour because of the heat. Same thing happens in the cold, right? So I don't think our country is 100% ready. And you listen to you know, the talking ads, they'll say the same exact thing. Is it going to be good that we have a battery industry? I think it's great that you have both. Electric vehicles are great for some drivers, not great for others. I mean, I drove here to Wisconsin today. I have a 
combustion engine. I grew up in Detroit. I still think a combustion engine is the way you drive a car. So let me let me chase that down a little bit, Brad. You mentioned EVs. You mentioned COVID and talking a little bit about the state of Florida reshoring. A lot of federal funding, a lot of deficit spending, trying to attract and incentivize reshoring. We saw some of the frailty within the supply chains during the pandemic, where we've gone from a just-in-time economy to maybe a resiliency economy. And what I'm already hearing from our members is moving back to a cost-conscious economy away from resiliency, reshoring, believe the hype, or, or even nearshoring to North America. What are you seeing in deals? I think we have a lot of interesting things happening. You have chips, you have battery, and then you have IRA 48C. Federal government and their wisdom, you know, issued that required that the 48C contact paper was due in July, and then the applications for the winners for the contact papers are due December 26th. Very fun for consultants, but really enjoy our Christmas holiday. Um, that supply chain is going to have to be there, right? The renewable 48C with the battery and with the critical components have to be there. If anyone read the Wall Street Journal, it was maybe early October, maybe September, end of September, China, which controls 98% of the graphite supply, said that, yeah, well, maybe we'll just won't send it to the United States, right? Well, maybe that's something we should have thought about before we invested in trying to turn everything to a battery. But with that being the case, the anode and the cathode are made with lithium, cobalt, and graphite. There has not been a, the investment in a mine in the United States, I don't think in the last 50 years. There may have been reinvestment, but there has not been a new mine. We don't have strip mining, right? We don't have enough graphite, so we're going to have to create it a different way. So we're going to see a lot of manufacturing on graphite and lithium and cobalt to get those materials. But ultimately, and you can ask your accountants and your lawyers, if you read the federal regulations, we're going to have to have technology in this country to convert synthetic, to create synthetic components to have the batteries we needed. The only battery that I ever needed was an Energizer battery up until now, maybe an AC Delco or an Interstate. But now that the batteries are going to do everything, we're going to all need batteries. So we're going to need that battery recycling. We're going to need to have that technology, but we're also going to need those minerals. So when you get to the reshoring aspect, this technology traditionally has been developed in a lower cost environment of Southeast Asia and in India, and the, the R&D is there. So you're going to see companies from all those places coming here, and you're still going to see, and I listened to the news this morning that there's 17 governors that signed a letter to the Department of Agriculture to figure out what's going on with all the investment um, into the ag industry from foreign direct investment. like. We have a lot of agricultural land and the ability to do a lot of this here. But the question is, is who do we want to do it here? We need foreign money. I don't think our U.S. companies have enough money to continue to keep doing it. And I wonder, you know, every company has a different cost of capital. So depending on what you have, a liquid capital to fund this. But if we really want to go as fast as Governor Newsom and his craziness is that they're not going to sell combustion engines past 2030, then we're going to need all these components into the United States. And the technology isn't here because we just don't have that here. But it, it's the same for the drug industry too, right? I mean, all the drugs in this country are developed here. I think one of the last, one of the, before Lilly put their facility in Raleigh, Nexus Pharmaceuticals, which is here in Pleasant Prairie, that was one of the first injectable pharmaceutical companies to go from scratch. Started out of the kitchen, he right. an immigrant, scaled, drastically scaled up the business and puts a $90 billion facility in Pleasant Prairie, a business you're very well familiar with and a company we are so thrilled to have here. And why did we do it? Because we knew the fresh water was there and there's fresh water in the injectable pharmaceutical. But the point being is that all the active pharmaceutical ingredients are coming from Europe. They're not made here in the United States. So what can we do is we have to start thinking what we want and what we want ultimately. We live in a, I hate to say it, we live in a, I'll call it a shop go economy since they're not around anymore, but we live in like a Walmart economy where everybody wants a 85 inch TV and they wanna have 
the newest iPhone and the newest earbuds and they want to pay nothing for it. And that's the way this country has been for the last 15 years. And now we have to figure out how to make it here. Um, and we saw for the first time during the pandemic that our supply chain wasn't there. But, you know, that's just me. Fascinating insight. And Brad, you've done a great job. You've mentioned DeSantis and Newsom without mentioning President Biden or President Trump. So very gifted, very tactful. So we have 80 seconds remaining. We have a room of hundreds of Wisconsin private sector executives. What would be, in 60 seconds, what would be your word of advice to the Wisconsin business community to improve the Wisconsin business climate? I would say you have to get involved with the WDC. It all starts with them um, and make them understand what business is. Um, every great economic development organization leads with someone that has the experience of being an economic developer. I will say, you know, Trisha Brown somewhere in the room, but she had that background and understood economic development and was able to change the strategy from an old WDC to a new one. They need someone that has that experience, that someone from the outside looking in that's not from Wisconsin, they can help Wisconsin step it up. There are so many great assets in the state, um, all the way up from Green Bay and Howard in the Fox Valley, um, west all the way to Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls. I mean, there's great beer there. Do you know that every supercomputer in the United States is made in Chippewa Falls? The two largest supercomputer companies in the world were there. We probably didn't know that, but that's in Wisconsin. Why? Because people from Wisconsin, A, don't brag about their success. Biggest problem. Don't market success. You market coffee shops and woodworking shops on LinkedIn. Market the good things that all your industry sectors are doing or where your growth is. I mean, I get that you have to have small business development and large business development, but if you have large companies, the small companies grow in droves to support the large industry. But talk about how great the University of Wisconsin is. I mean, fantastic engineering program, exemplary business school, um, one of the hardest universities to get into in the Big Ten. Um, probably one of the most bashful institutions and okay with being okay sometimes, hence why Greg Gard still coach. Um, but with that, but that being the case, you know, I'm a big Badger fan. Um, but our volleyball team's really good in case anyone wanted to know. But with that being the case, it's Ohio figured it out. Ohio State University was like, not only it was safety, I just had to show them that I had a pulse to get in in high school, but yet every major project that they win is led by the chancellor of the Ohio State University and the engineering department. They're the ones that are on the missions and on the trips. And like, I have not seen, the partnership that I've seen has been obviously with gateway coming in on the last couple site visits, but I haven't seen the partnership with the University of Wisconsin. And I will tell you, me, and Wade knows this, and I volunteered to teach for free at the University of Wisconsin and talk about what businesses really need to see to talk about our future business leaders and what they need to see. And I haven't received their return email from the business school, but sour apples a little bit on that. But um, the reality is, is I think we're seeing a lot of issues on college campuses today and um, near and dear to my heart, but you see a lot of anti-Semitism in certain types of teaching. But I think as colleges, I think everybody was told when you graduate high school, and this is my belief, they go get a four-year college degree. But a four-year college degree in art history is really never going to do you anything because I don't see if it may teach you to think, but you can't transfer into anything. So it's Got to go back to our high schools and our middle schools and get wood shop back, auto shop back, machining back, technology related to manufacturing back. Some economic development groups, I was in Green Bay and the Fox Valley a couple of years ago and their integration with their schools and they had a truck that taught the training, but it's getting into the high schools and finding out what people are good at and not pushing them to go to a four-year school, but also working with your um university partners and building labs and training centers where you're going to have future manufacturing facilities growing on that partnership because the people that are doing that are winning. That, but And Brad, that sounds like a report that was released this morning on work-based learning 
STEM education, career opportunities. So I think that's a great last word on advice to the business community. Get engaged, market success, and take a team approach. And it takes the business community. It takes governmental leaders. It takes academic leaders. We will continue this conversation upstairs. Brad alluded to Trisha Braun, Coleman Pfeiffer, and others. So we'll continue the economic development breakout session upstairs, as well as a workforce development best practices session upstairs. Briefly, my friend, I'll I give wanna, you the last word. Yeah, I just want to say I, I came to Madison in 1995, and my campus tour was ended with at the terrace on the Union and had my first underage beer there. Um, first in, and, you know, and I saw the beauty of Wisconsin, but I remember walking up and down State Street, and now I came back, and I've been here with my son, who's 11 years old, and my nephew, my brother, and I both went here. Two kids with Ann Arbor in our backyard went to Madison, um, and we saw and we got something from here, um, and that it, it's special and it's in our blood. I mean, if you look at the Wisconsin alumni base all across the country, they are proud to be Badgers. If you look at Green Bay Packer fans all across the country, they're proud to be from Wisconsin. The reality is it's time to take that spirit and energy and push it into driving something new and different because look what one little town that had 125,000 people when I got here in 1995 that was voted one of the best places to live. And look what you have here today. This building that we're sitting in, the Kohl Center, a beautiful Camp Randall Stadium, um, you know, the campus with all the new buildings, all the new high rises with people coming from all over to see how wonderful Wisconsin is. And you look at with Madison as one investment, there's so many other places within the state that need to sell their story and talk about all the successes that you can have in Wisconsin. Because ultimately what makes Wisconsin great, it's its people. And the people of Wisconsin and the people that I went to school with and the people that are from all the way up in Hayward to all the way to Manaqua to Eagle River to everywhere, they are all great people that love Wisconsin in all different ways. And you need to take the people together, and IT is power of the people, but drive economic development for the people. Welcome home, my friend. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Great conversation. Please join me in thanking Brad, and we'll continue the conversation upstairs. Thank you.